Hey, product launchers, welcome back. I have got a really cool interview for you today. I've got Jason McGee from take -A metrics And if you haven't heard about take -A metrics we're gonna get a whole earful today because you know what, this is the thing. A lot of you keep expressing to me that, you know, you're doing stuff on Amazon, you're doing all, you're using all this data, you're doing ads, and you have no understanding of like, is it good? Am I doing well? When should I change it out? So they've got, like, tons of metrics built in here and this is big data use so you know how i love about ai big data there's a lot of science here so we're going to get into a lot of cool interesting technology and details but this is really the whole point of this is really to help brands scale right like that's what we want for you we want you to grow i mean you've got great products right that's what we've been working on and now we want it to scale so i'm bringing on jason mcgee he's the director of seller partnerships and he is obsessed with helping you guys scale successfully on Amazon. That is what he's doing. He's working in building an ecosystem of best in class partners to help you as well, to bring people in. And so I am so excited to have him here and have us get to pick his brain together. So, hey, Jason, thanks for joining us. Tracy, thank you so much. I appreciate the, uh, the the intro, and I love the enthusiasm. You're matching me on the enthusiasm perspective. Which <laughs> I know is, you're excited um, about this because I've talked to you before, and I and I was like, wow, I kind of wish I was on Amazon doing this stuff right now. <laughs> yeah, well, it's so funny because like that's like the whole complimentary aspect of it. I remember when you and I first chatted, and, and I reached out to you, and it was just light bulbs, right? I was like, oh, Tracy, that's right. You got to do this, and what do you do about that? And we were just just throwing ideas back and forth. And, and this is just a hot topic, right? I mean, Amazon in and of itself is, but every, and it, look, it's massive shift, right? It's everybody wants to do not only grow a brand properly, they want to add new products, which is why you're in business. Uh, and on the advertising side, it's a pay to play marketplace now. So you need to advertise in order to be, to be found, right? So you and I, we're just like two different, like stepping stones to help brand scale properly. So it just makes logical sense that we talk and, and dive in. You know, I want, I, before we really get into, cause I want to get to know you better and I want everyone else to get to know you too. Yeah. But before we get into that, it's like, you know, I think that you've really hit on something you said, pay to play marketplace. And the thing is, is that for a real, for quite a while here, we were really lucky that Amazon was not the full play to pay to play marketplace because retail yeah. has always been pay to play. It's yeah. always been how much will you pay for your shelf space? Will you clear out the previous person and help and, and previous product that was there and help make the retailer whole? Like there was always a pay to play aspect. I was going to yeah. pay to be in the in the flyer that goes out at the you know every week in the weekly. You know, so there was always that aspect before. And then digital marketing comes in and it got uh, you know and Amazon was trying to grow their platform and they weren't really yeah. dialing in on that, but it's changed now and bigger brands are coming in and there's getting more competitive. And now it really is the, yeah. what it used to be in retail before. Yeah. It's interesting. So like, there's a few things. I mean, one, I'm an eternal optimist, so I'll talk about <laughs> the bright side of that. But yeah, I mean, look, we are in Amazon and we, we're a good partner of theirs and I, I'm, they're probably going to not like me for saying this, but Amazon advertising is where Google or Facebook, uh, Google was, you know, 15, 20 years ago. So I think that the difference though is obviously when it comes to the, the scale that the internet gives you and that in and of itself is great, but like it's a little bit different and more niche than just getting an end cap and paying for the end cap in like a traditional retail. Here it's, if you, it's like, actually I was reading a really cool article in The Economist and it was the, the most, uh, the, the biggest resource is no longer oil, it's data. It's so, data, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And so what I love about it is like if you can, one, it's two things. It's you have access to data, but that's only half of it, right? You need to understand and then actually action it. If you do it the right way and forget about us helping you, whatever, like the folks who do it the right way, whether they do it manually or automatically, they're able to be in front of the end caps of the internet and, and make sure it's in front of the folks that actually want to buy their solution, not just happen to be walking by. So right. the whole idea about targeting, obviously it's scary in a way, but at the same time too, as a consumer, I, I in a way I want to make sure that things are in front of me that I want to buy. Advertising is just a very darn good way to do it. So whether we <laughs> really? like it or not, it's here. So. That's right. So uh, have you ever been a seller before? I have, I have. So I, so uh, my, my previous uh, role uh, at, uh, was a company called World First running partnerships in North America for them. Again, not like we actually, World First that has provided like bank, bank, local bank account solutions for sellers. I bring that up because 
I was trying to create an ecosystem. I was like, look, we help international sellers, but I need to understand every component of it. So I actually created uh, and marketed and started my own uh, a freeze-dried probiotic dog treats on Amazon. <laughs> so I went through the full process. I, 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 uh, I found a supplier. I didn't want to go to, uh, I wanted to stay in the U.S. for, for the goods because it was freeze-dried chicken, for instance, and probiotics. So I sourced here. I, I, I sourced my bags, so did, did the whole process. So I've done end-to-end. So when I when I, I like to think when I talk about what we're, what 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 we're doing, like I've done it, I've ran ads before, I get it. So yeah, I, I short answer is yes, <laughs> yeah, which is really good because I, I think when you have knowledge of that. So like I mean, I always feel that that's my shortcoming is that while I have had products that are selling on Amazon and actually some that are there today, I've never personally managed my own account on Amazon. So I don't yeah. have that in-depth knowledge, which is why I bring all of you experts in. That's why I bring in Brenda Kremi, Jenna and Jeff Lieber. And you know, like I yeah. have these people who come in and, and help us out because I don't have that kind of experience. I want to make sure because yeah. I drop off of the, after the first run of production. And yeah. so, you know, it just, well, we have to pick it up. Like, it's a thing right. too, like, Somebody has to pick it up from there. So <laughs> yeah, that's it. I mean, obviously we'll get into who we are and what I specifically do at Taken Metrics, but that's it. It's like, I mean, maybe that's a good time to transition. I don't want to, you know. Yeah, no, 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 uh, that's absolutely it. So, but you have great deep knowledge of having done it hands-on and you know how difficult yeah. it is. And and I think that's what so many sellers are struggling with. It's like, where am I on the scope of things? And this is what I think I found really interesting about you guys at Take a Metrics is that, is that there is a way to play and you have what you call a flywheel, which I'll have you explain um, mm -hmm. in a minute. But um, it, it's like, it's not too soon to be playing with the data. And I no. think that that's really like what I see as a big difference is when we're talking about the flyers and the end caps and doing all of those things. When we were doing this in retail, we had no data to work on. No, no, no data. Like, well, that's at least you can calculate a true ROI, right? It's black and white, uh, um, you know, or as best as it can be. I mean, it's definitely not like doing a radio ad, you know, where you can't really measure reach. Or, right, or yeah, you, you guys have, have provide a lot more information and, and just being in the Amazon world and having digital marketing, I mean, we have a lot more data than we used to. When we used to recommend products to go onto the flyer that would, it's a circular, that's what they called it, the old Sunday circular, yeah. like was a big yeah, deal. Right. But you still didn't know, was were people going to respond to that? Is this a good ad? You had no way to test it out. No A-B testing, sure. none of this stuff we could do. You do it, you pay all the money to be in it. It goes out and then sales boost. Yeah. Like that's all you know, and so it's it's you yeah. Know, none you can't of it. attribute it. It's hard to run a test because you don't have sort of any sort of a you know test group, right? And like that's an right. independent agent. So no, I get it. And like we always talk about. I mean, yeah. I mean, I love talking to you too. And I was joking with you about like there's a shirt I should get you. It's called uh, "Data Is My Bacon." <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. but yeah, I mean, th that's it. And I think for us, we, I love to obviously, you know, tell our CTO, uh, Tish Salvi, he, he always talks about, look, it's very complex in order to the, the mathematical like computation it takes it to, to bid and do things right and recognize this as one thing. But the other thing too, is you need to make a thousand or hundreds of thousands of tiny changes very quickly to know which one works and keep doing those. And if you realize that something's not doing right, be able to pull it back really quickly. Yeah. That's also uh, important as well. It's like a billion tiny steps get you to where you want to go. But if you take one giant leap, I mean, you're risking it all because you may hit a point of no return. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and this is the thing, especially when we're playing early on, we want to see returns really quickly. We, we, there's not a yeah. lot of time to get your, your launch out, to get things turning, to make these decisions and to know which yeah. ones to make. And so, you know, I, this is an astounding statistic. So I'm going to have you talk about the whole flywheel and all of that, but 34% yeah. improvement in revenue, you can achieve what you've achieved on average with your clients over the first 60 days of working with you. Yeah, that's, I mean, 34% yeah. is a big deal. And you know, it yeah. could be more, that's your average. So and that's it. I mean, and the other thing too, is like that actually, that statistic was ran from a recent cohort analysis of our clients, but that's also at a same consistent a cost level. So the advertising cost of sale, meaning the dollars you're willing to give up for advertising sale, that means we're keeping those, you're not having to spend, you're spending more money necessarily, uh, you know, cause you're returning more, but you're not like, it's a profitable uh, you know, revenue growth. That's, yeah. 
that's a thing too. Yeah, you're not just throwing money in it and just getting the sales, which, you know, when you go on that higher, as you put it, ACOS, yeah, when you go on that yeah. higher, sometimes then you're overbidding it. That's what, you know, that's, the term. that's, ex- no, that's exactly right. And I think for us too, it's like, that's also the context of that too, is those folks who are looking, they're like, hey, look, I like our ACOS where it's at. Let's just ramp up uh, our sales in our organic revenue, not just ad revenue, but organic revenue. Yeah. Um, some folks want to just lower their costs or make uh, their A costs and make it more profitable. That's a separate topic. But I think the one thing that's really important is people often lose sight within Amazon. Amazon counts A costs, which is advertising costs to sell. The problem with that is that's just your ad spend versus how much you're spending to uh, on your ad revenue. The whole point of advertising isn't to increase ad revenue; it's to increase your organic revenue. So that kind of is what we talk about with Flywheel. It's like, look, the things that you're doing now, having a good product, sourcing it correctly, making sure that it's something that people want, and then you advertise appropriately, all these small things that you're doing, or large things, are helping you grow your brand and your total revenue, not just one specific component like ad revenue. Right. So for those of you who are um, listening and watching this and are not in the blog post for this episode, in the blog post for this episode, we'll have a picture of what the flywheel looks like, but we'll talk it through right now because I mean, you guys kind of know what a flywheel is, especially if you've been on Amazon because they're famous for their flywheel. So I love that you tied the two things together because you know what? Hey, we might as well talk just like our, just like our, our platform, right? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah, so I guess just real quick, just about us for those who don't know. Uh, Take a metrics, we use big data to help uh, sellers and brands optimize their business for profitability predominantly on Amazon. So what we do is, is we center on a few things. Is before we even look at advertising, which we're very good at automation and helping to increase your return there, we look at uh, brands, large or small. So I know for you, Tracy, for instance, you talk to folks who are nascent, or excuse me, yeah, they're, they're nascent and they, they're, they're, they're just, uh, and they're Amazon only. You have folks who are just massive brands, but Amazon only. You have folks that are retailers that are now coming into Amazon late. I mean, it doesn't matter where you're coming from, whether you're, you're, you're an agency running this for clients or, or a large brand or a small brand. Everybody... My, I actually put a LinkedIn post about this. And I think I tagged you in it that uh, my grandmother always told me we put our underwear on the same way. There is no <laughs> difference between being a small brand and a large brand when it comes to the, the metrics. Right. So what we do is we go, look, before we advertise, let's understand the, 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 the actual metrics of your business. What's your gross profit as a company? We created that metric called Tacos, which is total advertising cost of sale, which I only say this because it's so important, regardless if you're using us or just in general calculating it, is how much are you spending on ads and what is it doing for your organic revenue? So that, that's it. So number one is let's look at business metrics. Number two is let's understand your product level profitability. And then let's use that data to understand how you should be advertising uh, as well. So that's why we're really obsessed with data here. I mean. I, that's, uh, that's why you and I, you know, got on so well. So. Right, exactly. Well, and you know, because uh, let's talk a little bit about product level of profitability, because I mean, in a sense, a lot of people who are on this platform listening to us right now are in the development process of their product. And yeah. so I think that this is very, very a deep understanding that needs to happen. So if you've never done this before, this may be new to you guys, but if Mm -hmm. you've done this before, you're going to hear and you're going to go, Oh my gosh, that's what I did. That's what I should have. That's what I should have done. So thing happens is when we, when we launch a product um, and we're new to a factory, they don't trust us yet. And so they don't always give us the very best pricing that it could be. Now I have an inside track. Most of the factories know me by reputation if they haven't worked with me before. And so typically I get a little bit of an edge better for my clients. Like that's what we try to do. That's why we have a team on the ground because, and, and so this just happened actually. So I have this, we have this uh, big um, digital seller. Like they, they probably sell more over their own website than they do on Amazon, but they sell on Amazon as well. And it is, um, uh, not, it's not memory cards, but it's basically like, you know, the ones you put in your phone. I mean, you put in SIM SIM cards and like that kind of thing. So they're, they're basically like that, you know, storage devices, but they're mini, the mini small ones. And, um, and I'm sourcing one for a new product and we're, we're launching a new microphone that will have one built into it. So you could just record straight into your microphone. 
Wow. And so, and you'll just take out your SIM card and, you know, plug it in somewhere else um, and That's or awesome. download straight to your computer, right? So like, it's going to be yeah. really easy. And so they were like, and so we, we benchmarked them and said, what are you getting? Because you buy these things in bulk and you're doing yeah. this. What's your yeah. benchmark for this? And, um, and they, they gave us a number and I said, oh, wow, that's a lot higher than I expected it to be. This might change our cost of goods. Like, you know, really let me think about, should we bring in, should we have this native to it or not? Like it made me reconsider it. Then yeah. I get my factory price back and it is like half the price they, they, they told me they're buying. And so oh that's goodness. the benefit of having this like team because inland within China, when you're buying it from one, one factory is buying it and putting it in another product, totally different prices than when you're buying it yourself from the U S and they're exactly. jacking it up to be honest with you. So yeah, you, know, you, there's a, there's a in China benefit where a lot of Chinese sellers are doing a lot better on pricing than you are because of that. And so, but you can leverage that. Once you yeah. start selling, when you have throughput, when you have volume, that's exactly now right. you mean, can get there because now they want to just do more business with you. Yeah. Well, it's so funny because you apply that not just to business uh, in general, but like even within advertising, like the goal of selling a few products. I, I think when I look at launching it, and I did this with my brand uh, it, it initially, it was like, all right, I know that I'm going to order like very, very low MOQs just to like get a few products and just to test it. Right. I just had in the back of my mind at scale, if I'm running thousands or hundreds of thousands, what will my price point be? The goal right now isn't to be profitable. It's to right. prove product market fit and to prove that I can sell this thing. And if so, I already know I'm already calculating my cost of goods at scale. Uh, and <laughs> so guys, did you hear the language product market fit? Do we not talk about that all the time here on product launch <laughs> hazards, right? Like those are exactly our words. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, and I mean, yeah, absolutely. It's exactly. That's why you and I get on so well. That's right. But, um, exactly. Yeah. So, and, and like, so that's it. And I think the important thing to think, and I think it's really good. Like if you, tr if you ask a lot of folks what their gross margin is or gross profit and how they even calculate it, they're probably going to give you a, 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 a different answer. Yeah. So I'm just going to at least, I think it's worth at least defining it as we see it. And then you might have a little bit of a different, like what, what I look at it is I look at gross profit uh, on, on a product on Amazon. And I think, two things. You have two sets of costs. You have landed costs, which is ordering your widgets, adding on whether, how you shipped it, and you get a per widget price on what that is to at least get it, get it to the FBA or Amazon center, for instance. Then if you're shipping FBA, you have Amazon's fees. So you have their commissions they take, their storage and fulfillment fees, a pick, pack, and ship. The other one that people don't include, um, and it's actually taken out ahead of time as well, is their, their, their ad spend. So if you then take out all the Amazon fees and you have your land of costs, you have your gross margin and your gross profit. Then obviously you need to keep your lights on and run your business and put food on the table, et cetera. That, that's sort of a, a separate thing too. But like that's the wiggle room you probably teach is like, hey, look, you need to make sure that you have enough to keep the lights on and, and wiggle room to run promos to actually scale this thing properly. I don't know if you see it that way, if you'd add anything well, in. I, I do. And see, here's where I think I run into some um, controversy the way I talk about it with, uh, with direct sellers who they're like, oh, those Amazon fees, they're so high and the advertising fees and they start talking about that. And I, and I look at them and I say, well, what about the people that you've had to bring on to be able to build this? What about the warehouse that you had to, that you have to you have to fund? I was like, I don't think that you really understand actually how cheap this is for you to be testing this out. It sounds mm. like a lot of money because it's a percentage is big, yeah, but, and it's a chunk going to them and not you know to you. But at yeah. the end of the day, I have people who are running direct sales model and they are, have a one percent profitable business. Oh my like, goodness! I why do that? Right? Like. Well, it, well, me, that's, that's it. Like we, it. I don't know if you run in this too, but the, we have a lot of sellers, large and small, like they don't even know whether like Alistair uh, McLean Foreman, the CEO of our company, he loves to tell this story, which is he was one of the first sellers on Amazon. And he was, you know, actually like, like a lot of, you know, very good companies that come from, he, he started this from his Harvard dorm room and he was, <laughs> he was selling like sunglasses. He was like one of the biggest, very large uh, seller and one of the very first ones to sell on Amazon. He would walk around and be like, I'm a million dollar seller. I'm a million dollars. And then I know he sold his first company. He always goes, well, they really took it to me because they actually were asking me like, how much money are you really taking home? What is your profit? And he goes, light bulb went off. He goes like, I don't know. 
So, <laughs> and, and that, you know, and, and that's the thing is you can be like the, uh, what do they call them? Like the, the Amazon, like refresh button jockeys where you're refreshing, seeing how big your sales are. But like, all that really matters is whether you're making money or not. Right. And that's the way we try to look at it. We try to set you up for success in the future. Now, sometimes, yes, when we're launching, we have to take a hit because we really have to make sure the product market fit is right. Because if it's not, we should just dump out of it now and not move forward. So that's the most critical thing to do. And I don't mind I don't mind breaking even. I don't want to lose money. I don't want my clients to lose money, but I want to break yeah. even in that stage, test mm-hmm. it out. But I want to also know when I go in that my product can be priced successfully That's in the future. Exactly and so right. I, I plan out those percentages and, and I plan them out for my clients so that they can either get bought out or get on the retail shelf. The, the metrics should be very similar. Mm-hmm. And yeah. that's how I look at it because there are a lot of metrics on, on the shelf where there's a lot of added costs that you have no idea about. The landing costs are, are higher because they charge you, because mm-hmm. when they look at landing, even though they might ship from China for you, like they'll pick it up at the port. But yeah. from there, they're going to take it from there, but they're already going to have factored in the landing costs that they have and their warehouse allocation. So they're already going to have an allocation on there. And if you think there's no ad costs, you've got to, you're kidding yourself because you will have to pay share of shelf space and all the other stuff that's that exactly you right well it, and, yeah and sorry i didn't mean to interrupt but i think one other thing too is like when we talk about like it's funny because i you and i were talking about this soon when when somebody comes to us and this is how we've evolved to our, our full flywheel solution as opposed to just being focused on ads only is like they come to us and the first question we ask is hey well uh, about your products is where are they in the life cycle so are in like, if you look at like the, I uh, wish I could show us, I know this is going to be in a podcast. So you can't see me doing the, the hand. The hand <laughs> He's like, moving his hand around. No. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, I'm growing like a curve. So it's like, you obviously have like launch phase. Then you have like growth phase. Then you have profitability phase and you have liquidation phase, like the life cycle of right. the product. It's an S curve basically. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think like when, when, when you think about how you, you have to, when you set your advertising budget and what you're willing to spend, you have to consider two things. What is your margin now? And what growth phase are you, what phase are you in? So if you're at a launch phase, it's very realistic that you may lose money on advertising just because you're gaining market share. And if you know the product market fit there, it's like you just do a big push to actually get as much real estate as possible and start, and that's how you get the flywheel started, right? You just get the flywheel started and start spinning it faster. So and a lot of hand gestures here, but um, <laughs> yeah, but that's right. So that's like- a, Watch you, the video. <laughs> yeah, right? So once you know you, you it, it's worth it and like the product's doing well, you're like, all right, now people, like I don't have to, it's not launch phase anymore. We're Now we're in growth, we're optimizing profitability. That's when you start dialing back your, it, two things. You either dial, like you refine how you advertise and then you start taking advantages of at scale you're getting better margins which allows you to change your price if you want and there's so many things that happen when once you just get to that person right right and but yeah really setting yourself up for an acquisition is a lot harder today and and that's what i'm all about here is let's build ourselves great product ip let's get it profitable let's get it really really ranking because when you're when you're really ranking you're churning you're really doing all of those good things that Mm -hmm. take a metrics numbers and and information that they're going to give you keeps you up there on that sales wheel right Mm -hmm. so it's keeping you up in that positioning so position is important but margin and and profitability is extremely important as well and it's going to keep giving you indicators of am i getting the best price possible am i getting am i at the volume i need Mm -hmm. you know it's always going to be giving you back these numbers and information that's going to tell you whether or not you have a future acquirable brand well that's it like i I talk to a lot of uh, a lot of either brokers who buy and sell businesses a lot of folks who've sold businesses or bought every end of it and you ask them it's like hey how do you value a business and they go well we look at a few things number one is there true ip there Am I actually buying IP? That's obviously what you're talking about here is yep. creating very good IP. Is it scalable? Uh, that's the other thing as well. And then the, another thing, there's obviously copious amounts of things to look at is, are you profitable? Because a base evaluation based on your, your, your profitability run rate and your return uh, and not your, your total revenue. No, so that's what they look at. So, yeah, well, and and most people, because their profitability rate is actually so low, they end up with a division, a division of revenue rather than a multiplier of revenue, and that just sounds awful, right? Like, who wants to close out your business like that? It just doesn't seem like oh, all that effort was worth it. 
Yeah, no, that's exactly right. You hit the nail on the head. But yeah, I mean, look, I think the beauty that we're talking about here is like there's something regardless how big or small, there's something you can do about it. And like, that's the thing is like, look, it is what it is. We can obviously be upset about it and moan about the the times and days of old, or you can just evolve and just and just make it work. I mean, that's that's exactly what you do in your own business yeah. too, which I respect. Right. Let, so. Let's have a process. Let's have a team. Let's have uh, have tools. And so let's talk a little bit more about how you guys develop this tool. So you you alluded to your to your founder who uh, is a yeah. Harvard grad, and I just love yeah. you have a team of of science. I mean, you've got a lot of, of tech people yeah. there. I mean, so tell me a little bit about the team. Well, it's great. So I think that, and I'm so glad you mentioned that, like the reason why I was so attracted to join, and I've known Alistair for, for years too, is like when I asked him, Hey, like, what are you guys really doing there? It was not about, Hey, here's a solution. I was like, here, here are the people. So if you look at the people, um, I mean, one, a lot of folks from ex Google X, uh, like Boston consulting group, um, you know, ex IBM Watson, uh, our, our chief data scientist is one of the world leading professors of econometrics at MIT. These are the folks who are active in our business on, you know, a daily basis building it. I mean, so that being said, I was attracted to the caliber of folks, folks here as well. And, and, and yeah, and, and then that just translates right into the product. I mean, you see just the, the, the presentation of it and you see how we carry ourselves as a brand. It's funny. I thought when I when I saw Take Medics and the co- and the content they, they were putting out, I was like, this person, this has to be like a five hundred person company. I mean, we're growing. <laughs> and we we're now uh, by the time we we're probably like mid seventies now. Probably by the time this airs, we'll probably be eighty plus. I mean, but that's the thing is like we're ma- we're managing over five billion of uh, dollars of GMV of Amazon revenue. That's like two or three percent of Amazon's GMV. So that's it. It's like you have very smart people and access to a very rich data set that we're using for good. We're able to look at an individual seller and be like, hey, here's what you can do to perform better. Matter of fact, we're going to do it on your behalf so you don't have to. <laughs> yeah. So, so you don't have to. I'm all about the done for you systems here. So yeah, that, that's because, the power of delegation and a team. <laughs> right. Because you know what? This is the thing is this, it's so hard to keep up. It is so hard to keep up on all the things we need to do, what's happening on Facebook, what's happening on Instagram, and I mean, where we're marketing and where we're doing all of these things to begin with. It's hard. But to keep up with the what's going on on Amazon and what's working there, that's next to impossible to keep up and balance all of the things that you have to have your hands in as, as, as running, as running a a product business, right? I mean, there's a lot of balls in the air. Yeah, I mean, it's right. It's like the whole difference between like working in your business instead of on your business. Uh, and that's it. And like, that's why, and that, that's the thing is, is as somebody who's done it myself, it's possible to do it yourself. And there are folks who do it very well. And there's obviously folks who outsource it to teams of people who want to do that. But I think for us, it's like, we have such a good relationship with Amazon. We're part of the developer council. We like let us figure out what the latest and greatest is and what you should be doing about it. And that's why we're going to keep evolving and doing what we're doing. And the, the proof is in the pudding. Like the way we, we, we price what we do too is a percentage of advertising that we're managing for you. So right. at the end of the day, it's like, if we're doing a good job, you're going to see it. If we're not, then and that's it. Like it, it's, it's, it's come and go as you please. And that's, it. it's like, it's, well, so, and, and this is what I like, you know, if your clients succeed, then you guys succeed. Like it's not that's a, it. it's a win-win it's shared, for you. It's shared success. It's shared success. And, and that, that's what it comes down to. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, and that's it. Like people just want access to info. That's why they obviously come to you is like, we just want to know what's going on and we need to know the folks who that we need to be able to build trust. And that, that's it. It's like, we call it human assisted SaaS. There's like a component, which is automation and doing it for you. But there's this human element. It's like, all right, well, like you can never replace uh, like a lot of the intuition that comes from you and things like that. It's just, you have to blend it together. Well, and yeah, let's talk about that because there's a lot of fear around AI and big yeah. data and all of this stuff. Yeah. And, and you know, the thing is, is that, is that um, I am, I am, afraid that the u.s is actually a little behind like i yeah. see a lot of ai no. stuff going around in the world that i'm i'm impressed by and yeah. i was like and we're still having the the de- debate about it where yeah. i think that you know it, it is there is human controls here that's what you guys have going on it's human mm-hmm. inputs that is the most critical part and it is the part that i criticize a lot in my column because i think there are a lot of companies that don't have the right diversity in terms of information on mm-hmm. on informing the ai so where i think the opposite of what comes off of amazon because in retail we have 
a large portion, I say this about every single episode, about 86% of what we do at mass market retail is bought or influenced by women. So when we don't have women on our team or we don't have women's information in the data, we're getting false results, right? We're not going to get good results. So Mm -hmm. that's where, you know, the sales itself though is indicative of the data, right? It's, it's the right demographic already. You're getting yeah. the input you need. So when we're basing our decisions on, on pulling that and not on our gut reaction to that, we're actually going to be doing better because, hey, let's face it, and I'm going to say this yeah. as a woman, we don't know what they think, right? <laughs> so, yeah. But we can see the pattern of what they do. And yeah. if our machine is interpreting that and, and we're not going counter to that, that's are going to that's, mess that's it a, up. That's exactly right. And I think the beauty here is like Amazon does a good job to, to a certain extent of giving, giving data. What they're really bad at, admittedly, they'd say this themselves, is making it easily digestible. So I think for There's us, when we look, yeah, yeah, and, 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 and they're in different places. So I think when we look at it, like there's sort of two main sources of data that comes from Amazon. You have the advertising API, then you have MWS API, which includes sales history, conversion, all the historics on, on everything that you sell, inventory, et cetera. So Our MWS, per- we got to define stuff here for those yeah. who are new. So oh we're talking goodness. merchant something or other. Yeah, I actually don't, I should, this is going to be embarrassing. I probably should know what that acronym <laughs> is. <laughs> well, I don't. So I, it's probably like merchant web services or something like that, but I, yeah, I, I'm sure uh, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's yeah, MWS. Yeah, the, the the marketplace web services there. Marketplace. Go. Okay, so was either yeah, merchant or marketplace. I knew it was going to. Yeah. Be- so if you look at it, so that would that will allow you to have access to all the products you have listing, all the parent child SKUs, how many, the inventory you're listing, the the impressions, the clicks, all of your your or historic sales data is there. Then you have the uh, advertising API, which is pulls in anything related to advertising, like. Your 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 campaigns, your your keywords, your 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 sales, your impressions, etc. So the thing is, is those systems don't really talk to each other. And so the, what a lot of people don't realize is that if you want to affect how you advertise, you can't do so without the context of understanding if, if you adjust the price on your actual organic say uh, listed item or your conversion changes that it actually should in fact in, like impact how you advertise. So what we do is we pull in both data sets. So we pull in all, both data sets, I think cross references like 10 to 14 reports. And then we go, okay, well look, like advertising, like if you change or adjust your price, they're thinking about it. If your cost of goods is the same and you adjust your price, your margin changes. That means if it goes up, you can afford more per click. Or if it goes down, you can't, you're going to pay for clicks you can't afford. You need to understand that, that how that impacts it. And a tool like ours actually does it for you. And again, I'm not trying to make this uh, about uh, uh, like us as well. It's more just about like the data. And like, if you were doing this on your own, you can do it, but you need to be making th- hundreds of thousands of cha- keyword changes. If you have hundreds of products, you, you, it's just it's just ridiculous. Like Massive. you don't have time to do anything else. Wow. Wow. So yeah. so yeah, that's just that. That's just. I mean, the idea of it is. And so this is the thing. So you're talking to. You're talking to a designer here who actually has a spreadsheet mind, which is very rare. Yeah. <laughs> and so like, you know, that's, a, I, I have a data mind and, and I love data, but yeah. it's impossible for me to make the amount of decisions that I need to make on cost of goods and can we lower the price and can we get where we need to be? And is this more profitable without pulling all that data together? And yeah, yeah, so, yeah. and, and thinking about that, you've got 14 to 15 different reports that you would have to run. Like it would, it would mire me down in being able to make decisions. At least when I work with Walmart or something like that, I'm going to get one report and I'm actually going to be able to see most of what I need. But if that's not coming from Amazon that way, wow, you guys are, you know, you're flying blind and, and you, Oh my God. I can't believe you said that. Like Alistair, whenever we talk about like presenting what flywheel is, we literally show a picture of a guy holding the steering wheel like this with, <laughs> with a blindfold on and it's the sellers are flying blind. It's they really are. And, and that most people are. And, and the, I, they're also flying blind because they aren't experienced pilots. Right. So like they also don't even know what instruments they should be looking at, even if they had the blindfold off. And that's what you're pointing out through this. Yeah. I mean, if you've got 14, 15 different instruments, different spreadsheets, right? Different reports yeah. that you can run, but you don't know which ones affect each other and which ones to do, then how, how are you going? You're going to spend all your time educating yourself in that and not being 
core product expert, a brand expert, and serving your customers and, and coming up with what, what's next. And that's the visionaries that we serve here at Product Launch Houses, right? They care about their products. They care about the brand they're growing. And you've got to stay in that element and stay out of the things that you can't fix yourself. And that's where we call the right things in the right order with the right resources is what we're all about here to try to, to try to bring that together for you. So that's, so, that's incredible. Yeah, that's so true. It's just like, do what you're good at. Like, know what you're very good at and make sure you focus on that. And then right. you hire a team around you, whether it be people or, or tools or a combination of both to get the job done. Right, right. So the other thing that I think that, you know, I would love to see come out of the data is as you start to see this, though, you're going to start to understand what new products you should be developing, but also what you should be getting rid of, which I think people make this, we, we talked about this before, that people don't make a decision to get out of a product soon enough. They, their profitability yeah. starts to decline. There's more competition. You really can't improve your advertising and get that organic sales going. Yeah anymore you're at a plateau so, well let me ask you this so that's really interesting so i know it's always contextual but like what are some indicators that show you oh no like this might not be i mean is it that it like the declining revenue declining and then i guess it's seeing what happens and understand why it's happening right are you is right. revenue declining because of uh, entrance in the market or yeah, I mean, usually it's a it's a competitive flood that I see that happens most often in it. And what happens is, is that when you don't have something extremely original, so like you're not, you know. True IP. Yeah, it's true IP, but true IP that matters to the market. Like you've got the feature that no one else can really have. Got that really it, sets yeah. you apart and is the reason people are buying in your category and buying from you, right? So that, that you know, you ha must know that. Um, and so when people are coming in with what is knockoffs, cheaper prices and all of those things, but they're not hitting that feature, I don't worry as much as long as you haven't seen a decline in your sales because of it, right? And so yeah. um, that means you have to work a little harder at it. So that's the very first indicator for me in a marketplace is, wow, you've got a lot of competition mm -hmm. and your feature's not standing out yeah. enough. I either yeah. beat that up, it's time to do something really original mm -hmm. for you or move on. So and let me, let me ask you, sorry, I just have another question yeah. for you. So I know you typically stop at first run, like you get to first run, you stop, but obviously we, we always talk about the power of monitoring your reviews and your competitors reviews to do one of two things, either optimize your listing because they are misusing your product or they're misrepresented in some house. So you can alter that. Or two, you find product features that you should be altering. Yeah. So uh, uh, do you see that quite a bit? I don't know if you... So, uh, you're so yeah, with. so I, I actually personally have two programs that I do. So I do, there's a brand strategy program that I do yeah, for yeah, yeah. someone who has a bigger, more cohesive brand. So it's different when somebody launches a product, I'm going to stand, I'm going to hold hands all the way through the first run of the product because mm -hmm. I want to make sure there's nothing goes wrong. And I also want to identify the cost reductions that could go from that point forward for them so that they can get, keep getting their costs down and, and keep getting the efficiency and volume up as the volume yeah, goes up. So. Yeah, yeah. We identify that and, and we put a team in. I just don't personally follow it from that point forward. Yeah, um, I mean, that's just so powerful. So Yeah, yeah. But on the, on the brand strategy side, that's what you're right. Like it, those that have data make it a lot easier. But for those that have data, they think that they'll just go, oh, okay, here I'm going to draw the line. And I'm drawing the line for those that are listening. <laughs> drawing the line and everything below this, I'm just going to get rid of. Yeah. And that's actually the biggest mistake that I see ha being made because – some products help you sell other products. So That's exactly it's right. It's a comparison yeah. situation and it also is a, a companion situation. So sometimes you have what we call lost leaders. They're making no money if you drew that line, but they're the reason people are coming into your brand and checking you out yeah. and then they're buying something better and more expensive. And that is really what's driving your business to profitability. So if you take out your lost leader, now all of a sudden you, have no, you lose the leading edge. Yeah, and I guess a very, very basic example of it would be, uh, I, I worked with this this brand. It's actually sweet. So they 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 have they sell a wine supper for very cheap, but they actually I think it's Argon. They actually sell the the Argon so it keeps your wine fresh. Yep. So I, that just this they don't do this, but um, that's an example where you could actually lose on selling on the cork because you're going to get renewing purchases of, of the, the the Argon, for instance. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is where, you know, you have to really look at a, a, 
brand as a whole and but not having enough data about the profitability of the brand that's actually where it matters more is is this being profitable where is volume and sales driving and where are products being sold together and so when we take a look at the uh, when we take a look at a program and take a look at a brand as a whole we yeah. look at that synergy between all the products and then we look at the ones that need to definitely be cut because they're either they're draining you they're costing you money so yeah. we, we try to cut those of course then we look at the ones that they might be on the edge of costing you money, but hey, maybe if we got you a new source or we clean them up and made them, um, made them fresh in terms of style, like maybe we give them a new color or material or something like yeah, that, and now cool. they'll be refreshed and people will people will be more excited that it's new again. Um, so we do that. So we call that cut clean and then and then create. You have to create some original pieces because if your goal is to sell your brand, you've got to have. You don't have to have every single product in your line be an original, but you've got to have some good core IP that's driving people to your brand. Yeah, and and so that's and where we put your point that. too. I mean, I think, I, I think about when I first got started, like, you know, four or five, five years ago in, in the industry is like, anybody can just grab, it was all the rage about like grabbing a spatula and just in a remake it or, a, or a silicone mat or whatever, or like gloves. And then I think the whole point was like, look, that's not a true brand. That's like what we call private label. So yeah. like when you actually look at a true brand, it's like, okay, well, like it, the brand represents something and you have multiple products underneath that brand that, that are very cohesive and frequently bought with, or, you know, or something like that. That's where I think people are really winning. Yes. And it's tough because like, I don't want to, you know, the, you know, be, be the Debbie Downer, which I'm an optimist, but it's like, you know, I just get worried that like, I, I, my challenge is like, if you're not really building a brand, like I can understand why, why you're no longer getting the sales that you are because you're, you're, you're just have a bunch of siloed products that have no relation to each other. And like, that's just not sustainable. Yeah. So this is where I see a lot of people cycling on their products. Like they, mm. all, another thing is because you have so many products, if you're starting to look at the, the data that you're providing them on what's really turning, what ads are working, what keywords are working, you can dive into them with determining, wow, I'd love to do more products here. I'd love to do other things. Now, mm. not direct competing, but using those keywords, they have companions to them, right? They have other things that can go along with them. This can be a key indicator for where you should develop next. Cause that I, that's the question I get the most from Amazon sellers. It's like, well, how do I decide what product? I was like, well, what's your brand? And they're like, well, I don't have one. I just have hundreds of products and they're all over the place. Oh and man, I'm like, that's so tough wow, to deal with. I really don't know how to help you. Like that's going to stress me out because I don't know how to help you because I'm just going to suggest a bunch of things and you're going to go, I don't know. And, and yeah. so you don't know, it is a shotgun approach is really what it is. And I'm not saying yeah. that it doesn't work because it absolutely does. I see companies doing it left and right and making a ton of money on it. So yeah. it does work, but but you have to know that you're when you look at it overall, you got I I we I met a guy who had eight hundred products and he was only ten percent profitable. So I was like, wow, mm. why are you still carrying all these products? So well, because they're already up there and they're already ranking. Like, well, why? Like it's yeah. too much to manage. Call, like Yeah, you too much and you're spending I mean, you're spending money for no I mean no return. Even if you're breaking even, you're losing your time, you know, right. and probably sleep. <laughs> right. And so to me, if if that's your approach, nobody cares that you have all these products. Like they don't care that you have eight hundred in your store. So yeah. you might as well get rid of them and just keep them the the ones that are on the growth and the ones that are profitable and use the data to your advantage in that standpoint because it just mm -hmm. doesn't make sense. And then figure out you bring in a bunch of new ones and then you decide which ones out of those you're going to call and move them up into the into the core program and and be on a constant churn like that when you're intentional about your brand that's what we do when you're yeah. intentional in creating for a brand it's a little bit different because yeah. you're you're making something that you know the market need is there and now you're going to test out am i right about that need yeah so. and, and it, it's funny you mentioned that because one of the things that we do on the product level uh the section of what we do is we look at what's all the revenue you're making on these products and then what's your margin on these products? And you can quickly see, look, you're driving a lot of revenue, but it's not a profitable product. Right. So immediately don't advertise that product, number one. And number two, you find these hidden gems. Like, look, you have a great profit margin here, but it's not really generating sales. Why aren't you pushing this product? This is a much, much better one. And like, this could be the genesis of a brand because it has very good margins and it's something that that's unique and, and, and folk, folks like, I mean, that's, I bet that's probably the, the most fun part of your job is when you get in there and you recognize these like, like um, Ooh, there's something here. Right. Yeah. yeah I yeah, mean, yeah. to me, actually the easiest part is they're like, I've got a great product. It's really selling. Now, how can I make this really original and stand out? Like that's easy actually for me to go look at it and go, here's how we, 
we can make it like because of all the reviews, because most people don't understand how to interpret that into I can build a feature on that, right? Yeah. Uh, that's the experience that I have in that. So I look at that and I'll go, yes, we can make this. It would, it would improve the functionality. It's also going to be something that looks really cool. So you'll be able to highlight it. So it's going to stand out and be an easy feature to sell. Yeah. This is where we should put your dollars in development. And now you're going to have something that stands out that nobody else is, there's a barrier to entry for them to create it because you've got to have tooling or you've got to do something like that, that creates that level where the, the sellers who don't want to work that hard won't, won't work that hard to develop a product. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's a great, that's right too. And I think that's the other thing is like, like, and I know it's a sore subject, but like one, like I've spent a lot of time in China as you have too. And everybody like often complains like, yeah, there are folks everywhere in the, in the world who may like hijack this and whatever. But, like, I think like there's just like, there's, there are a lot of folks who just bust their tail ends that work so hard. And that's, that's a big thing too. I'm like, I don't want to like, like hard work is a foundation for anything. And like, I just see a lot of folks going above and beyond doing things that a lot of other Amazon sellers won't do. And yeah. it's also like, there's also like a pride component too. It's like, I have 800 SKUs. It's like, okay, like, it's not about how many SKUs you have, you know, it's really about like, what, what like, let's, let's look at the details here. Right. Let's build a really profitable business and brand for yourself. So you can go on and do something else with that money, right? Like do something else with that, whether it's something you want to do personally or get yourself acquired, whatever that might be like that you should yeah. be making life better. And of course you're improving lives by having great products out there. So like, that's, you know, also a goal for me is to make sure that you're putting in really good products and really great quality products and sales volume is usually a good indicator of that. I mean, people don't keep buying if something's not good. No, so. no that, that's, uh, that, that's exactly right. It's, it's well said. No, it, it's, it's true, but it's, uh, no, it just, it, it, it's a lot of fun at the end of the day when, when you get it right. And like, yeah, it's just all about helping people. That's the right. biggest thing is like, are we helping these folks scale? And like for us, like Amazon in and of itself is a high, relatively high churn business because you have a lot of sellers who come on and don't make it. So I think a, a churn is a big metric for us. It is like, yeah. you know, when we have, when we have such a low rate that that shows us like, look, it's a competitive industry. We're helping these sellers be successful and grow and scale. Like that is the measure of like, look, when we come down here, like three, four, five years from now, like when we look back, like how many folks are still with us because it means they've been successful. Well, and you know, I think that's really one last thing that I want to touch on before we go today. And that is that, you know, a lot of companies, especially the big data companies that are working on things and others, they're, they're headed into working with um, the big brands that are emerging on the market because there's dollars there, right? Like they can charge them a bunch yeah. of money. And, you know, I just I was interviewed uh, the CEO of Indiegogo. And they're doing that. They're working with Bose and GE and doing campaigns with them. And I was, and I was looking at that going, that's way more profitable for them. That's why they're going into that. And they just turned a profit. And so I started thinking about that. It was, is it going to start harming the smaller campaigns? Yeah. And they, and so I asked him that question and he was very straightforward about it. And he said that, you know, they put in metrics and they put in things so that it can't balance out. And, and at the end of the day, it, GE's product isn't any good. It won't, it won't outrank someone who has done yeah. everything in the grassroots and didn't spend the dollars. And yeah. so, you know, that's really where I, you know, you guys have really built your system so that it doesn't matter how big your brand is to do it. Mm -hmm. No, you're right. And I think for us is like, we give brands uh, and like we work with very large brands as well, but we give every brand large or small the opportunity to, to be on the same, you know, level and, and be profit. And the, the beauty here is like with Amazon becoming so much more sophisticated and how they advertise and you can like in pulling in, like we, we obviously are competing with everybody else, but we're also competing against your own self too. It's like, okay, well let's look at your own metrics and figure out what looks good for you because your methodology and your targets are going to be different than somebody else's. The challenge is, is yes, money does sort of reign supreme and folks with big budgets can, can obviously come in, but it's different. Like yeah. you can go in the old days, you can go and buy up every newspaper and buy up every ad, ad space. But like now, like we have brands that are competing with Folgers coffee and they're a small brand because they just done it the right way. And they've created a sort of cult following there. Like we're helping those brands win. Like, yes, we have some of them, but if you look at the meat and potatoes of what makes up our company, it is these, you know, mid market SMB sellers who, who, who do have good brands because obviously typically folks with brands are more likely to advertise just because you know you're 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 owning your own real estate but that's it i mean 
we're just giving people every every company, large or small, the chance to be successful in their well, and, and you know, early on in Amazon, the big brands were at a disadvantage because their organizations couldn't get with it to figure out they they mm. treated it as small time. They didn't look they at that. They treated it as like a wholesale channel instead of that's like right. You know, so they, they like dumped product there. Like I can tell you the reason I was on Amazon so early because it was the products that they they, they got didn't out want. of. Yeah, they didn't yeah. want on the shelf anymore. They, they, th they thought it was like a liquidation channel and absolutely right. not. Exactly. Yeah. And so I was like, I was like, my products are on Amazon and I think it was like 2006, seven, like they were already running through there in their early test days. Yeah. But it was like closeout stuff from big brands. And so, um, but now, you know, they're starting to look at it as a sales channel and as important and as a, you know, as a place to be. And as they do that though, you still have the advantage here as a small to mid-sized brand. Man, I, I agree. They don't, their data, the way that they analyze things, their numbers don't mesh with what works today on Amazon. And so. they're not as nimble. Like, like if you if you grew up in Amazon as a company and like that's what you lived and breathed and that's been predominantly your biggest channel, which a lot of these you know, growing brands are, you are in the driver's seat because you understand things that these all, these folks are going to try and catch up, catch up with as well. And yeah. that's the other thing too is like, like you living your business every like you're going to get into the weeds and work at times that others won't and understand things at a deeper level than a lot of other just employees working out at a company would do. You know what I mean? That's just the way I look at it. Yeah. But, yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, and I really thank you guys for leveling the playing field as much as you can on the data side, because it gets really yeah. overwhelming, especially for the creatives who are making great products, adding inventions into the world yeah. and bringing them out. But yet we don't always have that capability of being able to crunch those numbers and have a visibility. Yeah, yeah. And that's what we're here for is like, look, we, we have extremely powerful data packed in a very, very easy to use tool that, that anybody could, could rock in and be successful with. So, yeah. so Product launchers, I have uh, got links to everything um, right on the blog post at productlaunchhazards.com, and that's hazards with two Zs. And um, Jason has a, a direct link into their team there so that you can get all the information. So yeah, yeah, I will. Yeah. yeah, all of yeah, that. And we're also giving you guys, uh, we're giving anybody of uh, Product Launch Hazards a free trial for 30 days as well. So I wanted to make sure I let you know that. So Yeah, so very cool, guys. So you can go in and check that out and sort of test it and see what you're seeing here because I can tell That's you for those of you who've been, for those of you who've been spreadsheeting it you're gonna go wow this is not a spreadsheet this is pretty oh it's showing goodness. me metrics yeah 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 absolutely we like those aha moments and you know what we like to see what these folks are selling too and we're just like man this is awesome <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. exactly so crazy. thank you so much for coming on today James. yeah seriously thank you I really really appreciate it. this has been awesome uh, I can't wait to chat with you again yeah. So product launchers, productlaunchhazards.com. That's where the blog post will be. That's uh, where the video will be if you want to watch that. And that's where we'll have some extra images from this episode. Until next time, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks. Appreciate it.